The following program includes mature subject matter intended for adult audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. In 2006, 10 year old Zachary Miller was kidnapped and brutally assaulted by one of Canada's most notorious pedophiles. Peter Whitmore, already a convicted sex offender, tortured Zachary for two days. But how was a repeat offender free to victimize yet another child? Tonight, in a joint investigation by 16 by 9 and the Toronto Star, we examine a series of systemic failures by the justice system. And in an exclusive interview, Zachary Miller and his family share their story of those two horrific days for the first time. Here's Robert Cribb. They were just going to ride their bikes around and stay around the farm. About an hour after they were gone, I got a little concerned, so I took the quad out and I looked around. Didn't see the boys anywhere, so I drove into town. Pam gives me a call, and uh, her voice is way out of character. She says, uh, Zach's missing. And I'm kind of like lost. I mean, what do you mean missing? And she says to me, that guy has him. She's at the other farm by herself already looking for him. They weren't there. I asked a few people if they'd seen Zachary. They hadn't. But I looked in the garage and Zach's bike and the other bike were there standing up. The bikes are the key. They're parked. Zachary never sparked that bike. And that's when I knew something was wrong. Whitewood, Saskatchewan. It's an inconspicuous small town surrounded by miles and miles of open flat lands and farms. It's where Peter Whitmore put into play one of his most horrific crimes. I was chained to a metal bed frame, and the chain was so tight around my leg that I still have scars from it. It was Zachary Miller, Zach, who Whitmore brutalized and sexually assaulted. He was only 10. This is the first time Zach has told his full story in public. It was July 30th, 2006, and Zach's parents scheduled a play date for him with a new kid in town a teenager who had just moved here with his supposed uncle, Peter Whitmore. We take off for a bike ride and we're gonna decide to go to a place about two miles from here, Bannon Farmyard. The boys make their way to the abandoned farm and head straight to the old garage to explore. Next thing I know, something grabs me from behind, my mouth gets duct taped, get something put over my head and I get thrown in a van. Are you screaming or are you? Why? No point in screaming. No one's going to hear you. The van finally stops at a vacant house roughly 20 minutes away. All is quiet. I get taken out of the van, I get a dog leash put on me, and I get dragged into an old abandoned farmhouse that has all the doors nailed shut, all the windows are closed up, and I just kept thinking about my family, and if I'd ever see them again. I kept wondering why this would happen to me, because this doesn't happen to people. We were terrified. We were terrified for our son. We were just praying that they would find them soon. It had been hours since Pam and Lyle Miller had last seen their son. Overcome with worry, Pam called the police. Two different officers showed up later in the evening and um, brought a picture, and Lyle identified him right off the bat. Well, that's one part that makes me mad to this bloody day. I met him, he had a flat tire. You helped him out? Yeah, fixed lots of tires. 
Lyle had met Whitmore before, seven days earlier, when Whitmore showed up at the farm unexpectedly. The Millers had a sign at the edge of their driveway advertising eggs for sale. So they were used to strangers coming in and out. When he came in the yard, he only saw a bunch of kids. Maybe that's what sparked the first thing in his brain was there's all these kids here. Whitmore introduced himself as Robert Summers, an alias, and with him, a 14-year-old boy. Whitmore told the Millers the boy was his nephew. But in fact, Whitmore had abducted that boy days earlier in Winnipeg and brought him to Saskatchewan. He's very amicable, nice guy, smooth talker, had a lie ready for everything. So the man that I had identified himself to you as Rob Summers, mm -hmm. you now know to be Peter, Peter Whitmore, Whitmore, one of Canada's most notorious pedophiles. One of Canada's most notorious pedophiles. But at the time, Lyle had no idea who Whitmore was. Whitmore would go on to visit the farm two more times, hoping to gain the family's trust. He went back the next day and suggested that his nephew and Zach hang out. So a play date was arranged. When Whitmore was leaving, his van popped a tire. So Lyle invited Whitmore and the boy to stay for dinner before he fixed the flat. We all sat there and ate. And the other boy, he sat in the living room, didn't he? We offered him food, but he wouldn't let him have food. And we really thought that was weird. And you offer him food and Whitmore says, he uh, actually had complete control of that boy. We didn't know that at the time, but that'd be the truth. This was completely premeditated. It was all part of Whitmore's scheme. He was going to force his fake nephew to help take Zach. Whitmore's third visit to the farm, he dropped off his nephew for the play date. It was the final step in Whitmore's trap. Offenders are masters at manipulation and exploitation. They are very adept at not only seeing opportunities to exploit, but creating those opportunities. Michael Burke is the chief psychologist for the United States Marshals Service and the chief of its behavioral analysis unit. He has spent almost two decades trying to find out the motivations behind the crimes of some of the most devious sexual predators in the world. Individuals with whom I've worked who are similar to Mr. Whitmore uh, are among the worst of the worst. This is an individual who th thrives and enjoys destroying human beings. He's an extraordinarily high-risk individual. Can you t talk us through what happened next? Well, he repeatedly raped me for hours on end, and once he was satisfied with what he did. I put me to work cleaning things. I've tried to fight him off, but he would just beat me till basically senseless. During the nights, I couldn't sleep. And I still chained to a bed with maybe a couple of crackers. Mice would come up out of the vents in the night and I would share with what little food I had with them because being raised on the farm, animals always come first. And they kind of give you a little bit of courage and strength to keep going. You're just a hopeless wreck. But that morning, you still have to get up and do things. You have to take care of the animals. It had been more than 24 hours. Zach was still gone. And the couple was crumbling under the weight of their anguish. We lived for hearing from the police, waiting to hear, waiting for the next report, waiting, just waiting and waiting. So you started thinking that this may be it. This man is obviously doing horrible things to our child. And if he's going to kill him, do it fast. Don't make him suffer. Individuals like Mr. Whitmore would fall into the category of enjoying the distress and enjoying the control and the humiliation uh, the degradation uh, that comes from fully dominating another human being. It's often difficult to determine exactly what drives violent sexual offenders.
But in Whitmore's case, his crimes are so egregious that Burke believes he's a sadist. Individuals who are interested in destroying a child's psyche. As one offender told me, I wanted to destroy her soul. These are individuals who are motivated by something much more profound. And you can't dispel that through treatment or through medication or, or, or through some surgery. There wasn't a person in Whitewood that wasn't terrified, each praying that Zach was still alive. Friends, families, and neighbors were searching high and low for signs of the boy. A break finally came when a nearby farmer spotted fresh tracks leading to the house where Zach was being held captive. He'd come to check his land because of what was going on in the news, and he'd seen tire tracks in a abandoned farm yard where there's not supposed to be tire tracks. So he rushes back and phones the police. From your perspective, though, from inside that farmhouse, Whitmore sees the yeah. cops, he hears the sirens, there's helicopters. He realizes he's caught. And... He's busted. It was the moment Zach had been hoping for. Whitmore dragged the boys to an old shed on the property while the RCMP surrounded the place. Zach says he started hacking away at the duct tape, binding his hands with a blade he found in the dirt. I managed to pick up some old hacksaw blade, I guess, out of the dirt. I cut the boundings on my hands. I kind of got my hands behind my back, and as soon as he got turned away from the door, I took off towards the door. I ran straight by the nearest police car, and I fell in about three gopher holes, dove through a fence, and yeah, I came up to an RCMP officer. This is incredible. This is terrifying. It is terrifying. This is a horror movie. It's the real, most realistic horror movie I've ever seen. After two days, Zach was finally safe. He had been abused and tortured. There wasn't a piece of his body that wasn't battered or bruised. Zach was taken away for immediate medical help, and Whitmore was arrested. I can't describe the first moment. I was quite relieved, but there's still that little bit of dread lacking in the back of your head about what happened. At the moment, it didn't really matter. Around 11 a.m., the Millers got the news. Zach's alive. Their son had been found. Tell me about that moment where you... I just felt guilty. It was my fault, because my mother was crying. I somehow did this to her. I'm sorry. Sorry that I was missing for those days. That I put you guys through this much. He said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dad. What did that mean? He already blamed himself. I just started crying. And I don't even remember what I said. I don't even remember what Zachary said. It was just the, the relief, knowing that he was alive. Did you think you were going to die there? Many points, yes. He threatened me. He held a gun to me. He cut me beat me, he choked me. Many points I thought it was the end. But my sternness, I just wasn't gonna let him win though. Even though it cost me more pain, I just didn't quite give in to him. I just did what I had to do to survive. Next. How a notorious pedophile was free to reoffend. There is never going to be a system that is failure proof. Locking people them commit, up behind people, bars is failure proof. We don't lock all criminals up in prisons forever. People do get out. <laughs> This is Peter Whitmore's mugshot. He has many just like it. Whitmore has been arrested and convicted several times for crimes related to sexual offenses against children. In 2006, Zachary Miller was added to his list. Sometimes I'll be dreaming and he'll just be there. I can hear him laughing at me. I can watch exactly what happened to me. 
happened to me over and over again, and I can't do anything about it. So watch it happen. Zach was 10 years old then. Whitmore was 35. For two days, Zach was held hostage and tortured by Whitmore. You have to do what you have to do to survive. Sometimes those things that you do will haunt you for the rest of your life. For more than two decades, Whitmore has crafted a rap sheet that reads like a grotesque list of devious sexual offenses against minors, including kidnapping, confinement, and sexual assault. This is on top of other crimes he committed, such as fraud and theft. Almost every time Whitmore was convicted for crimes related to his sexual offenses, he was given an early release. In fact, of his five previous sentences, Whitmore got out early three times. And within days, he was back at it. The most important thing to understand about serial child molesters and individuals who, who are pedophilic is that they are tigers who don't change their stripes. This is an enduring, biologically driven predilection. It doesn't go away. You've got a guy who's fixated, who's motivated, who's abducted before. The sentences he's received over the years for the crimes he's committed against children, for the lives he's ruined, have been, you know, be an understatement to say inadequate. Christy Dekowitz has been working with abused children for more than 20 years. She's been involved in some of the most horrendous child abduction cases in Canada. Dekowitz started working with the Millers in 2008, helping them come to terms with what happened to their family. You have here a repeat offender, a guy who's been convicted several times with several children over many years, and somehow he ends up at the front door of the Millers. What, what went wrong here? I don't know. I think the question is what didn't go wrong. The access he's had to children over the years is uh, unimaginable given the history he has before him. There are loopholes in supervision. There has been issues with monitoring him. Peter Whitmore's case is, is, is an example of a, of a system failure and a catastrophe. Daniel Brodsky represented Whitmore in a number of cases dating back to 2000. He's a complicated character. The first thing that jumped out at me um, when I saw him is how could someone who presents so well when you look at him sound so broken when you talk to him? Peter is, was the kind of client who fall into the category of people who don't need maximum security, but they do need a great deal of supervision. We came up with a plan, a set of conditions that he would have to follow. According to Brodsky, the plan included therapy and intense monitoring of Whitmore. It was working for a while, he says, until Whitmore's peace bond expired and those responsible for renewing it didn't. So Whitmore's restrictions were lifted and he kidnapped Zach. If there wasn't a failure in communication, in Peter's case, um, he would have gone on to live for years without incident, you don't um, and there would that, be no victim. You don't know that, Dan. You don't I don't have a crystal ball, but it was working, and there was no indication that it wasn't going to continue working. But I'm looking at a 10-page file of his criminal history here, where he did it again and again and again. People trusted him the way that you're suggesting we should trust him, but ultimately, he Ultimately, still went back to abusing kids. Rehabilitation is a very difficult process. It is two steps forward, one step back, and there will be failures. And you can live with those failures, considering the risks? There is never going to be uh, a system that uh, is failure-proof. Locking people them up behind people, bars is failure-proof. We don't lock all criminals up in prisons forever. People do get out. But there were many indications in Whitmore's file that show he would reoffend. Documents we collected showed repeated warnings made by the National Parole Board and psychologists of the high likelihood Whitmore would be a repeat offender. We're not rehabilitating, we're monitoring, we're managing the risk, and, and right now we're not doing a very good job of that. And if the intent is there, and any loophole is available, and the moment you're not watching, the potential exists for, for re-offense. And, and he is the type of individual that would take advantage of any, any slip. 
Experts argue the lack of communication between the different players in the justice system is so profound that offenders can slip away undetected. This can be especially problematic when dealing with a sexual offender whose victim of choice is a young boy not related to him. According to a 2004 federal government report, 23% of them will reoffend within the first five years of being released. Police sometimes don't talk to other police forces. Police forces sometimes don't talk to prosecutors. And for sure, people who are managing individuals don't talk to other stakeholders in the system. Doesn't this piss you off? It upset me so much that at the time I wrote the Minister of Justice and I said to the Minister of Justice, have a public inquiry because something went wrong. But the minister at the time, Rob Nicholson, denied the request. The minister wrote me back and said, you know, Mr. Brodsky, we recognize that there are problems in the reintegration of individuals. Two steps forward, one step back. We understand that there are problems, but we're not going to have a public inquiry. And that's where it died. That's where it died. What about today? Are we any different today? We're absolutely no different today. We reached out to the new Liberal government and requested an interview with the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, Jody Wilson-Raybould. She declined the interview request. I think the, the changes that need to be made are so significant that, that we're shying away from them. Whitmore was sentenced to life in prison for his crimes against Zach. But in 2013, he became eligible for parole. I would say if he gets out, he is in the absolute highest risk category for reoffending. My personal view with, with individuals who are in that highest level of risk is that they need to be managed in a secure environment. So far, Whitmore hasn't had a parole hearing, and there's no guarantee he would be released if he does. But some critics maintain his release would be far less likely if he had been given dangerous offender status, a designation that could make it harder for criminals to get out on parole. If you have dangerous offenders stamped on a file, that parole board who has to look at the file is never going to release him. If he gets a life sentence, he has a chance of being released. It's a label that's rarely given in Canada. Since 1978, 678 criminals have been given a dangerous offender designation. As of 2014, there were 25 dangerous offenders living in the community. In Whitmore's case, he never received the dangerous offender label despite his crimes. That's because Whitmore agreed to a life sentence and pled guilty to most of the charges. As a result, the prosecutor decided not to pursue a dangerous offender designation. Does he want out? Yes, he wants out, but he knows that uh, if there's any chance at all for him ever being released, he's going to have to um, work really hard and persuade people that he deserves another chance. We reached out to Peter Whitmore in prison, asking him to do an interview to talk about his crimes against Zach and others. Whitmore turned down our request. As long as he still exists somehow, I'll always be looking over my shoulder. It's been more than nine years since Zach was abused by Whitmore. He's 20 now. When you look back on your 10-year-old self prior to your introduction to Peter Whitmore, how is, how is he different than you? He had a lot less cares. He was never looking over his shoulder. I could sleep a lot better. I never had this dark cloud over me. As soon as that happened, that all changed. So you go from a little 10-year-old boy who has no care in the world to being worried about who's going to come up to your driveway, who's going to be there at night. It's a dramatic change that you can't prepare yourself for. Zach is still coming to terms with what happened. Some days are harder than others. Those who really know him know how far he's come. He's changed, there's no denying that. But Zach is determined to not let the attack destroy him. He doesn't want to let Whitmore win. I've changed a bit from what happened, but I'm still the same kind of a person. 
you just got to figure out how you're going to survive, how you're going to cope day to day with it. And once you do that, life just gets easier. It'll still come back and haunt you from time to time, but it just gets easier. But it'll never go away. Next, environmental disaster happening one drop a day. We got pristine Atlantic Ocean water. If that oil comes down there, and uh, in, in especially in a fishing season, we're, we're doomed. 